Welcome back or welcome for the first time to another Job Train How Talent Session. We've had a couple of weeks off for the summer and now today is back to school day and it's also a very different story in terms of the weather. A few weeks ago I was boiling today, I'm freezing in the office, autumn has arrived. But enough of all that, um, let's get started. Thank you so much, Ben Gledhill, Head of Resourcing Transformation at Thames Water for joining us this morning. Um, ben, how are you doing? Yeah, very good, thank you. Um, I was actually going to do some on my balcony, but it's a little bit nippy today. I know as a northerner, I'm not allowed to comment on the temperature, but no, no, it's a bit nippy. But no, I'm good. I'm good. Excited to uh, be here today and have a bit of a uh, bit of an atta. A bit of an atta. So for those that don't know you, give everybody a little bit of introduction to you. Cool. No problem. So obviously my name's Ben. Um, I've kind of been there, done that a little bit in regards to TA. So started off back in 2005, while I'm old. Um, <laughs> as, an IT year I started, <laughs> as, a, as an IT recruitment consultant, um, and I sort of worked my way up through the core kind of RPO and internal world. Um, when I started off at Resource, but now it's TA, but anyway, uh, tomato, tomato. Um, and I'm currently um, Head of Resource and Transformation at Thames Water in Reading. Um, but look close to working from home at the moment. Um, and I'm currently leading a, a function-wide uh, transformation. I look at everything really from kind of capability, uh, people, technology, process, experience. I think more importantly, the kind of culture of recruitment in terms of, you know, uh, you know how important hiring and retention is and how it's really a strategic function. Excellent. So we've got quite a lot to get through today. Um, you and I um, had a beer. Um, the other week so um, you know apart from uh, knowing each other through work I'm, I'm very glad to uh, you know th think on you as a friend as well but we, we had a beer we had a chat about what we might go through today and actually we realized it's quite a lot um, so some of the main areas are having a quick look at where is TA in recruitment right now given everything that's happened uh, exploring a little bit about technology and its role in automation the positives and negatives what to consider uh, big subject, uh, financial challenges facing TA at the moment and how we can best overcome them. Um, I think you described it as a yellow brick road to profit centre. So TA and recruitment and even HR is so often seen as a, as a cost centre, but how can we change that mindset both for ourselves but also in terms of leadership within our organisations? And then finally, a quick look at what is the future of TA and recruitment. So with that in mind, should we crack on? Absolutely. Tell us a little bit, so from your perspective, where do you see TA and recruitment as being right now? Oh, that's a big question. Up. It is, yeah. yeah. I feel like uh, messages are going to start coming in. So, <laughs> look, I mean, it, it, it's clearly a tough time for TA at, at the moment. And I think one, one thing that's wanted to do um, is a little bit of a shout out to kind of everybody in the TA industry at the moment. You know, um, I've got a lot yeah. of friends, a lot of contacts have gone through a really, really tough time. So, to everybody out there in terms of, you know, whether you're still kind of in a job, when you're furloughed, um, or whether you've sadly lost a role, you know, my, my heart kind of goes out to kids. It's a very, very tough time at the moment. Where is TA as of the 2nd of September uh, 2020? Um, I think on a, on a sad note, I think the whole kind of COVID pandemic has really shown how fragile TA is in a little bit of a way in terms of as soon as, you know, the economy started to struggle, uh, companies needed to downsize, um, you know, budgets were cut. TA was the first team. Uh, well, one of the, the first teams to go, really. Mm -hmm. um, so some could say, does the current TA function in terms of, you know, if there's no hiring, is it seen as obsolete? Some may say that, some may not say that. I think what it really has done is it's really probably highlighted the fact that we probably need to be a lot more kind of advisory and strategic in what we do. I don't know everybody throws around the words strategy and advice on the rest of it, but in terms of, you know, we, we, we mentioned this word talent, you know, but we need to be a lot more involved in what does talent mean in terms of, you know, internal mobility, skills mapping, skills development, and really guiding and advising the business, not just on who we need to bring in, but what we have and how, how can we develop that? Because there's no reason why the skills that we've nurtured and developed over the past, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, whatever, we can't um, kind of... Um, move to change that into a more kind of internal aspect um, and i think what's probably more concerning is you know that this isn't something that's probably gonna change overnight 
Um, you know, it's something that will need to change over time. And I think there probably needs to be a lot of pragmatism in terms of, you know, it is going to be a long journey. You know, um, I think I did my first ever kind of an experience talk at conference in 2016. And I think you're still seeing people talk about it now. So in terms of things that still need to be fixed, there's a whole lot that needs to be fixed out there. Um, so I think, yeah, again, a lot of the talks I give and kind of conversations in regards to let's get those basics uh, fixed first. But in terms of the wider picture, how can we change to this kind of this talent advisory model rather than just still seeing as, you know, we, we advertise a vacancy, we bring people and we, we assess them, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think sometimes the criticism is level that all we are seen as almost being sort of glorified admin roles. And I think sadly, perhaps quite a lot of that still existed pre-COVID. And perhaps maybe there's been a bit of a, a natural shake up or shake down post-COVID. And I totally agree with you in terms of us being seen far more as talent advisors. Quite interesting take from you in terms of expanding that out to cover mm. existing talent within an organization. Some would argue that is HR's role, but actually, no, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, but we need to step up and be seen as you know complete or total talent advisors rather than just you know focusing on those people we're looking to hire in from the outside. Absolutely, and I think one of the one of the the, the big things for me, people, you know, if any of the watchers and listeners know me, I've all, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not backwards in coming, uh, in coming forward, put it that way, but you know, no, it really, it, it, yeah, <laughs> well, look, I'm, I'm from Yorkshire, I'm, I, when, 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 when you're born in Yorkshire, you have to sign a contract saying that we, we won't dilly dally, we'll kind of say what we mean, um, but what, what really kind of hit me was when kind of COVID really kicked in, for example, the amount of webinars on remote onboarding and remote hiring, this should be BAU, you know, we should be agile, we should be flexible we should be able to kind of adapt using technology and using experience of a process so yeah i think it's just uh you know a lot of this goes back to what we did in 2008 2009 in terms of you know sometimes things happen in the external world that just impact recruitment and hiring and ta um, and i think things like yeah remote onboarding um, virtual interview, whatever that means, um, and, and the new ways of working, um, you know, they, they shouldn't be seen as ooh, a project or a transformation. It should just be seen as what we do because when the business sees that we're doing that, they have more value in respect to what we do, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I think for, for any organisation, um, COVID has pushed us all forward significantly in a really positive way in terms of embracing and finding new ways to use technology to solve specific problems, but do not forget that I think that a lot of us still haven't got the basics right. And you reference candidate experience, and there's some still some horror stories coming out on, I read on BBC about candidates that have gone through and completed X number of applications, not heard anything mm. back, you know, and that's just, in, in 2020, that's just unforgivable. So we've got to fix the basics, whilst at the same time looking forward in terms of how do we embrace technology, how do we see as more strategic talent advisors, that kind of thing. So mm. yeah, good summary for that bit. So in terms of we've started to broach on technologies, so it's a nice little segue into the next area. So you, when we talked about it, you said, well, there's a tipping point here. And, and is it time for more automation, which is quite sometimes quite a, a, a prickly or a contentious subject, because a lot of people see automation as taking the human element out of recruitment. Whereas obviously I've got a bit of an axe to grind here, obviously being the job train. But I think it's all about showing human consideration. Automation in itself is not a bad thing but it's about how you approach it and how you implement it. Now, you've got quite a lot of experience of automation, specifically in your previous role at Yodel. So do you want to talk about, you know, how you see that in terms of automation in its role right now? Bearing in mind, we're probably going to have, well, I know we will have, because we're hiring at the moment, huge candidate volumes applying. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I've I've always been, yet again, without wanting to sound like a broken record, um, I've always been a fan of automation. Um, and I totally, 101%, uh, don't buy into the line that it removes a human element. Because if you kind of take a little bit of a step back, what what does that mean? What is the human element? Um, and I think, you know, hiring is always going to be a human-to-human -human function. Um, and I think we need to kind of take a little bit of a step back in terms of, you know, what does human mean? It means warm. It means I'm getting nice feelings. I'm feeling wanted. I'm feeling valued. So I think it's in terms of, as well. 
Absolutely. So in terms of that, that, that hiring process, we need to really kind of look at, you know, what can a human do that a, a, what's a machine a machine will, will never be able to do? And that is the one-to-one -one conversation. You know, automation will never, ever, ever get rid of that. And I think James has just said that, you know, automation is a balance. James, absolutely, totally, totally agree with you. But things like the admin side of things, uh, very, very simple outreach, comms and engagement, um, contract generation, other bits and pieces where I hate to say it, we cannot do or we cannot complete that task better than an automated process. And, you know, I've got my uh, really random, but I've got my new iPad here. I got it two or three weeks ago from O2. Um, I think I only spoke to a human once, but literally every step of the journey, it was either a text message or an email. And the tone of voice of those bits of comms was like, oh, that's lovely. I'm just, they, they, they've sent the message and they've used my first name. Ben, wow, somebody or two knows who I am. So, it, you know, it, it's not always about, you know, it has to be a human, an actual physical human touch. You can use automation, but you have to look at things like the tone of voice. How does it make that person feel? But in regards to, you know, what will put a TA team over another one in terms of reputation. It is that, it, it will be that, that human touch. But you cannot tell me that, I mean, some of the job um, responses that we're getting at the moment in Thames, you know, one single job, we're getting 500, 600 applicants. There is no way that a, a human being can speak to every one of those people. So I think, I think we're way past the tipping point. I just think people really, really need to kind of buy into it and give it a whirl. Um, because as I said, you know, I think I think things will get worse without being too negative. So you have to look at um, really coordinating and leveraging what what can technology do for you, whether that is pure automation um, or whether it's, you know, things like a, de a decision tree process or machine learning or something like that and put your human recruiters uh, set them the tasks that they do well, adding value in those real human to human touch points. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I mean, let's face it, you know, recruitment is, was well, two things. Um, it's heavily um, admin focused. Mm. And there's so many of those tasks that can and should be automated. Absolutely. Because otherwise we are nothing more than glorified mm. administrators. Um, and the second thing to consider is recruitment is unfortunately a rejection game. Mm -hmm. fact is, if you're recruiting for one role and you've got 500 people applying for it, there's going to be 499 people at some point you're going to be disappointed. So, you know, at least the initial application stage, you know, using the right tone of voice, as you said, using personalization in some way and mm -hmm. applying it. Ultimately, what you want to be doing is, is a, basically probably the 80-20 principle in terms of you want to be focusing 80% of your time, your human contacts on those top 20% of candidates, but giving everybody else a considered experience. And it's not that difficult, but I don't think we're getting it right yet. No, it's really not. And, you know, a lot, well, I won't say, a, a bit, I won't say it's a tip, but we're working quite a lot with our uh, brand and uh, customer experience team at the moment to help us map out those journeys, because guess what? Those teams do it day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out. So, you know, there will be people and teams in our organisation um, that you can go and speak to and help to. And I think it goes back to probably talking a couple of years ago was in terms of, you know, there are so many resources that we don't use in an organisation, whether it's a business analyst, a project manager, a copywriter, whoever, you know, utilise these different skills to really make in that, that, you know, that that experience seem like an experience rather than a rather than a process yeah for sure uh, you know i think the um you know the, the candidate experience or in, even the employer brand does have strong ties into the consumer brand mm. and think of all the amount of investment of time and money and everything that, that goes into marketing teams goes into creating a, a consumer brand or a look on a feel a tone of voice and why wouldn't you call on that expertise and ultimately people want to feel involved they want to feel yeah. like they're the stakeholders there's nothing worse than creating whatever it might be in terms of the candidate experience and then having marketing or comms knock on the door and say well hang on a second have you created this you know be collegiate yeah. in your approach i think that's the most Absolutely. important thing there for sure Absolutely. okay cool um biggie here so you know we've gone into this crazy meltdown um very scary times in terms of the virus lots of uncertainty in terms of people's jobs and obviously the first thing that businesses right across the country have done is to strip out cost wherever possible um so that obviously that creates some fairly clear challenges from a financial perspective for ta and resourcing but but give me your take in terms of where we're at right now 
Oh, you're throwing these at me this morning, aren't you, Pop? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you really are. So, I mean, yeah, again, being being pragmatic, and I think, you know, this is probably what I will bring to the conversation, a little bit of truth and a little bit of reality. We, we cannot move away from the fact that some TA teams will have uh, – cost cutting exercise apply to them that's that's just fact we, we 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 can't we can't move away from that i think this goes this kind of this answer and maybe another answer and this kind of question goes back to the way in terms of i would say leadership and in terms of the the value that the organization places on its ta team and the kind of quality of, of your output and what i mean by that is we, we 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 have to think like other functions will do in terms of okay so if we look at our operating costs what is capex and what is opex obviously if you don't know those it might be worth kind of googling you know let's look at our financial agreements with vendors you know uh can we you know shave off a little bit of our service to get some cash back um, if we are going through a transformation process or a program rather, um, you know, are there any financial agreements that can we move into with vendors in terms of, you know, we, we, we use one of our products, we go on the circuit for you, we do these blogs, webinars, and all, all the rest of it. Um, and I think you, you really need to, you know, cause I always say to a lot of people that, you know, I'm not saying that I've stopped learning about TA, but in the past kind of five, six years as a leader, a lot of what I do now is, planning, budgetary control, uh, business case writing, um, and really showing the financial value of what hiring retention is to the business. So I think we need to get into the weeds a little bit in terms of really understanding our cost, what is our value, and I think, and I might be using it too soon, so I apologize if I do, but moving to the holy grail of being a profit center in terms of, you know, we can actually, in our own way, add value to that bottom line. So really, really, you know, easy example is, you know, we've done a lot at terms around, uh, you know, what is the value of our technicians? It says that if we don't fill technicians, uh, there's more calls and more jobs that get unanswered. That leads to kind of higher waiting calls and costs and fines and all the rest of it. And so the customer experience, you know. So, you know, it, it, it is really, you know, and I always go back to the kind of, you know, yeah, Joe, what, back in the day, time to hire, cost per hire, you know what, they, they yeah. They, they, they've, they've, they've had their day you know now it's things like you know cost of an mtc what is the cost of the business if we do not fill this vacancy you know what is the cost of that program or that project or that sales um that kind of that, that sales pool if we do not kind of bring those people in um, and and have open and honest conversations with finance you know understand you know what is capital expenditure what is operating expenditure you know what, what other what other things can you kind of bring to the business um so yeah obviously alex is just uh my good friend alex there said you know you know we need to illustrate the value of uh, what happens if you do not have in the business um so yeah i think it's really putting a pound sign i know it sounds quite simple but it's putting a pound sign next to what we do um, and how we do it and yeah again that all comes back to being seen as strategic and not transactional couldn't agree more. <clears throat> there is a value in cost for hire, but there's a greater value in um, cost for not hiring or worse still, cost for the wrong hire, which causes um, a hell of a lot of internal disruption, damage, all of those things, let alone the cost that has already been invested in getting the wrong person to the business anyway. Or, Absolutely. you know, the, the cost of not onboarding somebody successfully, so they become disengaged from the organization, then they leave, and then you've got to go out and hire again. But I think you, you touched on quite a good point there around um, making contact with vendors and partners and things. So you may have existing agreements in place, but we're all in the same boat together. I'd like to think that we are a bit of a community. I've seen a lot of community coming out, and that's not just in terms of TA teams and things, but also in terms of vendors. Have honest conversations with the vendors that you're working with. Um, but also, I think sometimes there is, um, in this position that we're in now, there might be a tendency to think, oh, oh look, let's not change anything. But actually, we, you know, we should be thinking about changing things. We should be mm. thinking about innovating. If we look at the way in which we advertise our roles, you know, we had Talent Nexus on a few weeks ago that were talking to us about programmatic. The simple fact is that you can save 30 or 40% in terms of your advertising costs just by doing it in a more targeted way. 
but also you can turn on and off the taps in terms of how many applicants you have and therefore save yourself a bunch of time as well in terms of you know invested so don't be afraid to start new things talk to vendors as well in terms of how you might be able to sort of rejig the arrangements or the services you're getting and that kind of thing they can only say no so if you don't ask you don't get Absolutely, and, and I've always been. I think we, we've had this discuss, uh, discussion uh, probably a couple of days one time. But you know, I really, really don't buy into the uh, TA team slash vendor divide. You know, um, we don't implement tech well enough, and then we blame the vendor. Um, you know, when, when things don't work, we also blame the vendor. It's like, yeah, but didn't we pick you? Didn't we go through like a six month process and did that rest of it? So just have on just have honest conversations, you know, in terms of look, there is part of your solution that we want. From a financial perspective, we'll be really honest with you, we cannot afford that. What can we do? You know, because I think you just need to be really, really honest and pragmatic and uh, you know, going back to the the whole kind of ways of working and changing you know how many companies now that vacancies are potentially creeping up um, how many people are just doing the same thing you know why are we not advertising in better crm and engagement tools why do we still spend laws and advertising why do we not use programmatic as you know i think it's wrong attack next you know turn off turn on you know but you know a bit of a karate kid there i think there um but you know I, it, it, it's quite it, it's quite disappointing that still, even though we've been through all this, <laughs> so there's, well, we, we, we've been through this hard take, we've been through this horror that is COVID, and it, we probably will come back. A lot of organisations are still just doing the same. Put an advert out there, assess people, hire them. You know, let's let's look at that that engagement piece and how can we get a lot more um, a lot more value from our book, really. You there? Got a bit quiet there. Have we lost you? You're still there? No, no, I'm still here. Yeah, I'm still oh, here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm no, I, I agree. You know, now is the time to, to massively reassess what we do, why we do it, and how we do it. Um, and I think, Chris, sometimes the criticism is labelled um, at vendors as well as the TA community oh. in that we are still quite conservative. And now is the time for change. Now is the time for improvement. Um, and we need to work in a collegiate way together to improve that mm. and, and, you know, approach it in an innovative way as well. You know, we, um, you know, we, we took the decision at the start of lockdown, um, not to talk about job training too much, but we were going to build rather than slide in, in this process. We've got a meeting on going on downstairs right now, completely um, pulling apart our existing candidate experience, you know, redesigning that and being very honest about what works and what doesn't, and very conscious of the expectations and also volumes of candidates that our clients are going to have to be dealing with over the coming months. But it's, it's important, shake things up a little bit and, mm. and, you know, don't be afraid to do something new, but do it with support um, of finance and things. So yeah. the important thing is to engage with others within your organisation. I think sometimes we, we operate in quite a siloed way, perhaps we're concerned or we don't have the confidence to go and talk to senior leadership about plans that we have. But it's about sort of laying it out. This is a specific problem that we have. Make it clear that there is a problem with senior leadership and then you'll get their attention. Um, back it up with data and then provide a really clear strategy and tactics for how you're going to solve that problem, what the expected outputs are going to be. And I don't think we necessarily do that. Or we don't communicate our strategic value as a function enough to leadership and get their buy-in. You know, we have these projects and we almost like trying to swim upstream in terms of getting buy-in and actually we should be doing it the other way around. So with that in mind, Ben, you know, what's your advice in terms of um, being seen as a, a more strategic function or, or, or basically getting the ear or getting the attention of uh, senior leadership so that you do get buy-in for projects or making changes or improvements? Um, I think I think very honestly, everything, and yet again, without kind of like a broken record, you know, I've, um, I, I've, I've been very lucky to have some really, really good leaders as, as mentors um, of my career who have kind of given me a little tidbits, obviously I've kind of developed those and kind of changed for myself. But, you know, everything that we do has to link to the the overall strategy of an organization say for example if i was joined by uh, my co uh, my colleague she works in finance my other colleague she works in marketing everything that the the the, 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 the finance strategy and the marketing strategy for the business would match the overall organizational one so that what ta has to do 
you know, if if um, if the overall organisational objective is to open up a new European um, arm of the business, or it wants to be seen as more agile, or it has to be seen as X, Y, Z, hiring and retention has to meet those objectives. And the other way that we will do that is have real uh, conversations with the, the C-suite. You know, if you're not speaking to somebody who has a chief in her job title, it's a waste of conversation. We need to get our direction uh, from the top. So, you know, and w w without oversimplifying it, I think that that's the, the, the bed and breakfast of what we need to do in terms of, you know, speak to the chief exec, speak to the chief people officer, speak to the chief uh, commercial officer, you know, listen to what, you know, listen to what she will say, listen to what her thoughts are in terms of, right, well, this is our 10-year financial plan, uh, this is what we want to do with our products, this is what we want to do with our customers, and then work backwards in terms of, right, okay, what's a people element? What do we need to do to retain these people? Have we got these people in the business? And then if not, do we need to go and find them? You know, is it emerging talent? Um, do we need to pinch? Do we need to borrow, build, whatever it is? And I think when you start having those conversations, you know, without being overconfident, when you ask for 50K for some advertising, or when you ask for 100K for a new ATS, you know, that 100K, because if we don't get the people in, it's going to cost 10 million. It's small fry. It really, really, really is. So you need to have, yet again, you know, James is on the money there. You know, Absolutely. you need to have, to have those high value conversations. You know, and it, it really, really, really does, yet again, you know, without being a little bit too boisterous before midday, it does irritate me slightly when people say, TA needs a seat at the top table. No, you don't. Just be a better TA leader. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. Just be a better TA leader. Have better conversation. I mean, I love nothing more than speaking to my HRD because guess what? I know every, every board meeting she's at, she's singing the praises of what we do in resourcing. That's because I've properly influenced her using solid data um, and projecting what will happen if we do not transform, if we don't have this investment. So... Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think we just need to be, yeah, a little bit more kind of direct with those kind of high-level conversations, really. Um, yeah, Lisa. Would you not agree that most of your questions don't know how to align? Massively. massively yeah, I'd agree with that, too. Massively. I mean, what, 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 what scares me, um, what scares me a little bit is, so, yeah, again, we all know, you know, there's conference and there's webinars and all the rest of them. I would love to hear a speaker speak around this topic without being rude employer branding evps yeah they were really cool five years ago um chatbots yeah they were good four years ago but how many people how many ta leaders uh, get promoted or fall into a position where they do not know how to communicate um so she's copying my business idea now she's gonna want commission on that uh um, you'll a consultancy next week won't you James? I know, uh, I know, you, know, you, know, you know i i i would love to go to a conference whereby there is a chief executive there uh, who is literally gives a talk to ta leaders this is what you need to do to get my money that's it i, I think you, you know you hit the nail on the head i think you know we, we operate in a silo, in isolation, too often. And, and the fact is that we, we have to, we're being asked to wear so many different hats within TA and recruitment, whether it's, you know, data analysts or sources or interviewers or training for hiring managers or that kind of thing. It's a lot and a lot is being mm. asked of us. And it's, it's, it's too much to think that you should know or understand everything about finance or operations or necessary HR and that kind of thing. That is why we need to be collegiate. That is why we need to reach out. We need to build our internal tribes and networks, our go-to people for information. They and really people do. like being asked, you know, if they they've do. got knowledge, they want to share it. And I think sometimes we're too afraid to ask and we're, we're almost like, I don't know, where we have imposter syndrome in terms of speaking to leadership. But you know, so you've got to stick your head above the parapet and you've got to do it backed up by data and with a specific solution to the problems that that business is facing. You, you really have, and just, just quickly on this point, so we're, uh, without kind of doing uh, too much self-praise, but we're, we're launching an annual onboarding platform later in the year. Um, and that 
um, that is going to be fully automated in terms of it's going to have um, a chatbot for various bits of temp checking or FAQ. It is going to be a cool. It is going to be a cool bit of tech. Um, due to the way that I've communicated it, due to the way that I've illustrated the benefits, due to the way that I've really influenced on the real impact of proper onboarding, and I don't just mean day one, you know, month three, month six, month nine. The first person that's going to be dummy for that is the chief technical officer. Brilliant. They're all over it because, yet again, yeah. they can see the value to their team. So do not tell me that execs and C-suite people aren't interested in TA. They are. You just have to get your message across in a language that they want to hear. Perfect. And, you, you know, yeah. I think we pretty much answered that last question is what is the future of TA and recruitment? Ultimately, it's operating at a oh. far elevated level than we do right now. It is. and I think In terms of our own skill set, but also in terms of the way we are viewed within our own organisations. And that's a responsibility on us. Massively. You know, we're, we're probably the only function in a business. Um, how, how can I word this? We're probably the, the, the only function in a business that you don't see more pe more people being sent to what I would call generic training or development in terms of leadership, financial management, coaching, and just just what makes a good business leader. Because you know as well as me, you know there's only there's only a certain amount of TA that you can understand in terms of employee branding, attraction, workforce planning, emerging sure. talent, and all these kind of bits and pieces. So the the overall amount of learning what I would call the, the kind of technicality of the role, it is minimal. After that, you have to become a better leader. And I think as well, we have to probably admit that, you know, COVID or COVID 2021, whoever, you know, these risks are going to keep coming around the globe. So you probably have to build in some scalability, look at how you operate and have the ability to, you know, I think we've already mentioned this once today already, you know, turn the volume down, look at other activities across the business when it comes to talent and then when those times do become a little bit busier you turn the volume up so yeah i think without you know sounding a little bit uh buzzwordy i think there's a lot more kind of agility that tony needs to look to and yet again look at how the sales do it how the marketing do it and kind of you know look at look at other areas of the business so let's not be uh, a siloed as maybe we have been totally agree great point to end on Ben, thank you so much, mate. I no really problem. appreciate your time this morning. You've been ace. Thank you to everybody that's joined us this morning. Um, I hope you'll come back next week. Um, we've touched on video. I've got Stephen O'Donnell coming on next Wednesday to talk all about video. It's numerous applications and how we can really benefit from it, whether it's supercharging candidate engagement, giving hiring managers the confidence to interview really well using Zoom and other platforms and that kind of thing, self-creating content. If Stephen's going to cover it all, even down to the equipment we need. So I hope you'll join us. But have a great week. Take care and see you soon. Thanks Cheers. Everyone, Thanks, Ben.